All right. Hello. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to my <clears throat> histopath lecture classes. Okay. So for this uh, particular video, I will be discussing about the second part of staining. Okay. The second part of staining is on uh, the different stains and staining solutions that we use in the laboratory. Okay. Yes, all right. So the different stains or staining solutions that we use in the laboratory, so they can be classified as either natural dyes or natural stains or synthetic dyes or synthetic stains. Okay, so kindly refer to your module on page 107. All right, so that is the second part of uh, staining. Okay, so examples of natural dyes uh, which we use in the laboratory include your hematoxylin, your coquineal dyes, and then also we have your orsin. Okay, all right, and of course, we have here also examples of your synthetic dyes. We have your acid dyes, your basic dyes, and of course, we have your neutral dyes. Okay, so those are the two major group of stains or dyes that we have in the laboratory. All right, so we will be discussing... Uh, each of these natural dyes, okay? So when we say natural dyes class, so these are um, dyes, okay? These are dyes that, dyes, okay? These are dyes that we get from your plants and animals, okay? So this, uh, they come from natural, okay? Natural sources, like for example, we have your plants and animals. So, if we are going to look at the history of your natural dyes, so they were previously utilized in the dyeing of threads, okay, or in the dyeing of uh, wool and cotton to, uh, to produce, okay, dyed threads, okay. One of the uh, most important dyes that we use in the laboratory is your hematoxylin. So class, take note that your hematoxylin, this is actually regarded as the most valuable. Okay, so this is regarded as the most valuable. So let me just uh, type that. So most valuable staining reagent that we use in the laboratory. Why is it considered to be the most valuable staining reagent? This is because, okay, this is because your hematoxylin uh, has two very uh, advantageous, okay, characteristics. Number one, it has a very powerful um, nuclear staining, okay? So it is capable of uh, really providing optical differentiation for your nucleus as well as the different chromatin or the different structures that are present in your nucleus, okay? Including your chromatin. So it has a very powerful, okay, um, nuclear and chromatin staining. So apart from that, okay, apart from that, your hematoxylin also provides or also has striking polychrome properties, okay? So let me just uh, type it here. So the first reason, the first reason, okay, the first reason why it is considered to be the most valuable staining reagent is because of the fact that it has a powerful nuclear and chromatin staining, okay? So it provides a powerful nuclear and chromatin staining, okay? Ulit, ulit, ma'am. Yes, why? Okay, number two, another... Okay, important, very advantageous characteristic of your hematoxylin is that it provides a striking polychrome, okay, polychromatic staining or it has a striking polychrome, okay, polychrome properties. Okay, ayan. So what do we mean when we say it has a striking polychrome properties. So this means, okay, class, this means that it provides differentiation. 
Okay? It provides differentiation of the different or of the various structures um, which are found in our tissue sections. Okay? So when we say differentiation, okay, we are not just talking about a monochromatic color. Like for example, violet or purple. Okay? If you make use of your hematoxylin, as part of your staining technique, it's not just a monochromatic um, purple or violet color. It provides varying degrees of purple or violet, depending, of course, upon the staining characteristics also of your tissue, okay, or of your tissue components, okay? So that is what is meant by striking polychrome properties. You do not just provide a monochromatic or a single violet color. So there are varying degrees of purpleness, okay, if there is such a term. Okay, there is dark purple, there is medium purple, there is purple, there is light purple, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's why your hematoxylin is regarded as the most valuable staining reagent in histopathology, okay? Yes. So take note that your hematoxylin being a natural dye, so it is actually extracted from the core, okay? So this one, from the core or the heartwood of a Mexican tree. This is in your module. The scientific name of which is your hematoxylin, hematoxylin campechianum. Okay, so this particular Mexican tree, you get the heartwood or the core of this tree. And from this, we are able to, okay, we are able to um, extract, okay, your hematoxylin. Yes, so it is your hematoxylin that is directly extracted from your, okay, from your Mexican tree. All right. Yes, yes, okay. So your hematoxylin class, this is actually not the active coloring reagent that we use in the laboratory. Why? Because in order to uh, in order to make your hematoxylin a dye or a stain, it has to undergo the process of oxidation, which in histopathology is referred to as your ripening. Okay, so it has to undergo ripening or oxidation. All right, so there are two ways by which we can ripen your hematoxylin. So one way of ripening your hematoxylin is via natural, okay, via the natural uh, oxidation process. All right, so we have number one here. We have your natural ripening. So when we say natural ripening, when we say natural ripening, all right, so um, we allow, okay, we allow your hematoxylin to be oxidized by exposing it to light, okay, to your sunlight, exposing it to sunlight and air. Okay, so we make use of natural factors, factors that are inherently present in the environment, such as, of course, we have your sunlight and air, okay? So the problem with your natural ripening is that it usually takes a very long time before you are able to, uh, to adequately oxidize or ripen your hematoxylin. So in particular, it takes about three to four months, okay? It takes about three to four months before you are able to adequately ripen your hematoxylin, okay? So that's the problem. So that's why in the laboratory, to make it more practical for us to ripen your hematoxylin, okay, we perform what we call your artificial ripening. Of course, if there is natural ripening, then there is also artificial ripening. So when we say artificial ripening, 
Okay? So, this involves the use of strong oxidizing agents. So, we add strong oxidizing agents to our hematoxylin, to the extracted hematoxylin uh, solution from your, uh, from your hematoxylin campicianum. Okay? And this will make the ripening process faster. Okay, so I repeat. So this enta entails the use of strong oxidizing agents. Yes, strong oxidizing agents in the laboratory. And of course, since you are using strong oxidizing agents, um, the ripening process, the oxidation pro 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 process, therefore becomes faster. Faster. Okay, ayan. So, it becomes faster. It becomes more practical for us to prepare your hematoxylin in the laboratory. Okay, yes. So, in particular, ma'am. Ma'am. Okay, so after the oxidation process, what happens to your hematoxylin? After the oxidation process, your hematoxylin is converted to the specific coloring reagent that we want. Okay, and that coloring reagent is your hematin. Okay, so that coloring reagent class is now your hematin. So your hematin class, this is regarded as the active coloring agent. Okay, that is produced via the ripening or oxidation of your hematoxylin. Okay, via the ripening or oxidation of your hematoxylin. All right. So one thing that you have to remember, one thing that you have to remember when it comes to artificial ripening is that you have to make use of the right amount of your oxidizing agent. Okay. So examples, class, can I just um, erase the additional notes? Okay. So examples, class of strong oxidizing agents that we use in the laboratory would include the following reagents, right? So we have oxidizing, okay? So we have your oxidizing reagents. So what are examples of this? We have your hydrogen peroxide, okay? That's one. Hydrogen peroxide, we can also make use of mercury chloride as an oxidizing agent. Uh, sorry, mercury oxide, rather. Okay, we can also make use of potassium permanganate. All right, potassium permanganate, sodium perborate, okay? And of course, we can also make use of your sodium iodate, okay? in addition to the ones which are already mentioned in your module. Okay, so these are the additional uh, oxidizing reagents that we can incorporate in your hematoxylin. Okay, so just like what I have mentioned, when you are going to perform artificial ripening, it is very important, okay, it is very important that uh, you have to make use of the correct amount, okay? Correct amount of your uh, of your oxidizing reagent, okay? So when we say correct amount, ayan, when we say correct amount, we have to qualify what is the correct amount for ripening, okay? So let me just uh, add that. Okay, so the correct amount class, okay, the correct amount pertains to the least amount, okay, the least amount of oxidizing reagent that is capable of facilitating the oxidation reaction or the ripening of your hematoxylin. Okay, so do not forget a uh, least amount, okay, least amount. Why least amount? Why do we have to make use of least amount? Least amount, and why do we consider this as the correct amount? This is because, okay, by incorporating the the uh, the least amount of your oxidizing uh, reagent, we are able to have satisfactory, okay, we are able to 
uh, produce or as we are able to come up with satisfactory staining. Okay? So the staining is already satisfactory. The staining is already adequate. And apart from that, making use of the least amount of your oxidizing reagent provides a longer shelf life. Okay? Provides a longer shelf life for your hematoxylin reagent. Okay, so those are the advantages or those are the reasons why the correct amount is the least amount. Okay, and you also have to consider uh, why are we very careful of not using the excessive amount. Okay, so if you added, okay, if you added an excess amount of your uh, of your oxidizing uh, agent in your hematoxylin so this will result to excessive oxidation okay this is uh, this would result to excessive oxidation which we refer to as dito na lang class ha sorry okay Inalagay. okay dito na lang all right. So this results to excessive oxidation or otherwise referred to as your overripening. Okay? The problem when you overripen your hematoxylin is that this will lead to the formation of useless products. Okay? So this will lead to the formation of useless products or useless compounds which actually are not needed in the staining, okay, in the staining uh, process or in the staining procedure itself. All right, so that's why correct amount is the least amount. Okay, excess amount will lead to overripening, and overripening results to the production of useless, okay, useless compounds or useless products. Okay, ayan. Uh, you also have to consider kasi that when you when you expose your hematoxylin to your strong oxidizing agents, this will result to the instantaneous, okay, conversion of hematoxylin to your hematin. Okay, yes, instantaneous, instant. Ibig sabihin fast. Right, so the the the, pro, the process of oxidation uh, happens in a very fast manner, okay, in a very fast manner, right? Ayan. So please take note of that, okay? All right. So another, yes, and dami natin side notes. Uh, let me just erase this, okay? Ayan. All right. So once you have your hematin, once you have your hematin class, can you use it? Pronto? No. Okay. You cannot. You should not. Okay. You cannot actually use. Okay. Or um, if, for example, you use hematin alone. Okay, if you use hematin alone, uh, this is usually in very rare cases. So hematin, this is rarely used alone. Okay, why? Because hematin by itself. Okay, hematin, hematin. <laughs> Sorry, my hands are very, are very animated. They have their own life. Okay, my 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 kaluluwa yung aking kamay. Yes, I can. Hindi ko mapigilan. Okay. Anyway, yes, ayan. Your hematin. Okay. Take note. Uh, the reason why it is rarely used. Um, alone, uh, alone, or by itself only in the laboratory is due to the fact that it has a low, okay, it has a low affinity, okay, for the, uh, for the 
various, okay, our terong spelling naman, okay. Uh, it has a low affinity for the various, okay, for the various um, tissue components, okay. So, that's the problem with your hematin. Alright, that's the problem with your hematin. It has a low affinity for the various tissue components, okay. So, in order to establish okay, a good connection. In order to establish a good connection, do not use PLDT. In order, <laughs> ako lang masaya sa joke ko. Okay, in order to establish a good connection um, between your hematin and your tissue component, there has to be an additional reagents and i have mentioned this before okay so what is that additional reagent it's your morda okay i have mentioned that before what is the function of your mordant again class okay what is the function of your mordant the function of your mordant is to link okay is to link is to provide a bridge between the dye and your tissue components. Okay? And so, actually, the use of mordants in conjunction with your hematoxylin, very, very common. Your hematoxylin can, uh, cannot be used in the laboratory okay, without the incorporation of your mordants. Okay, so the more than that's present in your hematoxylin increases the affinity of the dye to your tissue components or to your tissue constituents. Okay, yes. So you have to make use of your more than. And in the case of hematoxylin, there are several more than which we use depending upon the type of hematoxylin that we want to produce. All right? So what are examples or what are the different mordants that are incorporated in your hematoxylin? Okay? So we have your alum. Okay? We also have your iron. Okay? We also have your chromium. Okay? And then your copper. It does not rhyme. Okay, ayan. Uh, what are the mordants again? Yes, follow me, follow you. Okay, alum, iron, chromium, copper. Oh, bakit tong copper? Okay, it does not follow. Okay, anyway, so these are the different mordants that are incorporated in the hematoxylin reagent itself. Okay, remember, there are three ways by which you can incorporate your mordant. Right? It can be incorporated before the staining procedure. A good example is uh, the post mordanting that we perform after fixation. Okay. Another, you can also incorporate your mordant in the staining procedure. Okay. You can also incorporate your mordant in the stain itself, which is the one that we use for your hematoxylin. The mordant is incorporated in the stain itself. It is incorporated in the hematoxylin solution itself. Okay? Ayan. So, please refer to your modules. Okay. Refer to your modules. What are the two types or the different types of aluminum hematoxylins? Actually, in the laboratory, okay, the two uh, most commonly used, uh, most commonly used more than that we uh, incorporate in your hematoxylin solution is your aluminum and your iron mordants. Okay? So, your aluminum hematoxylin, um, it provides a blue color. Yes. The hematoxylin that is produced, okay, in or with your aluminum has or imparts a blue color. It imparts a blue color. 
Alright, so what are examples of aluminum hematoxylins? We have your Erlix, nasa module po ninyo ito, these are in your, these are in your modules, okay? We have your Erlix hematoxylin, your Harris hematoxylin, Bowles hematoxylin, okay? So those are the four kinds of aluminum hematoxylin. So out of these four, the two most commonly used are your Erlix hematoxylin and your Harris hematoxylin, okay? So, all of them contain aluminum as the mordant. So, what is their, okay, what is their difference? Their difference um, lie, or yes, their difference lies in the oxidizing reagent that is used. And of course, okay, the presence or the, the different components which are incorporated in your solution. Okay, so for your Erlix hematoxylin, the uh, uh, ripening or the oxidizing agent that is utilized is your sodium iodate. Okay, so if you can see the table that I have provided there, so the first column, okay, the more that's the mordant. The second column, that's the name of the hematoxylin. And then the third column, those are the uh, those are the oxidizing agents, okay, uh, that are used in the preparation of uh, the specific aluminum hematoxylin that we are talking about. And of course, the last column, so those are the functions or applications of the specific hematoxylin solutions, okay. So your Erlix hematoxylin, the oxidizing agent is your sodium iodate, okay, yes. And then for the last column, that will, uh, that will serve as your reading assignment na lang because if I am going to, uh, if I am going to just read it, kasi I cannot, okay, I cannot, ayan, uh, read na lang yan. Okay, because it's self-explanatory naman siya. Alright, so I can, I, I can no longer add anything because, uh, because it is what it is. Oh, it is what it is. What you see is what you get. Okay, ayan. So kindly read na lang the applications of the different hematoxylins as long as you are able to understand, okay, the uh, two important components of your solutions and that is your mordant and your oxidizing agent, okay. For your Harris hematoxylin, so it contains mercury chloride as the oxidizing agent. Your Coles hematoxylin contains alcoholic iodine. And then your Mayer's hematoxylin uh, contains your sodium iodide. Okay? And so now we move on to the other kind of hematoxylin that we have. So we have your iron hematoxylin. So in contrast to the blue color that is imparted by your aluminum hematoxylin or alum hematoxylin, your iron hematoxylin imparts a blue-black. Okay, it imparts a blue-black color. So we have two types of iron hematoxylin. We have your Weigert's hematoxylin, okay? And then we have your Heidenheim's hematoxylin, okay? I really love the names of our stains because you can actually name your kids, are, uh, yes, using this. Di ba ang ganda? Hematoxylin, come here. Hematoxylin. Pag meron nga ulit akong anak. All right. So again, uh, your Wigert's and your Heidenheim's hematoxylin, uh, although they are both iron hematoxylin, they utilize uh, different. Okay, they utilize different oxidizing agents. So for your Wigert's, uh, it utilizes ferric ammonium chloride. For your Heidenheim's, it utilizes ferric ammonium sulfate. Okay, and then again, you have there. Yes, again, you have there the applications of both your Wegerts and your uh, Heidenheim's hematoxylin. Okay? Another kind of hematoxylin is your PETA. Oh, yes, I'm very sure that uh, you have encountered this in your uh, histology before, in your human histology. So we have PETA. Okay, what is PETA? Okay. Your PETA. PETA stands for phosphotungstic acid uh, hematoxylin. Okay, phosphotungstic hematoxylin. Acid, sorry, hematoxylin. The difference of your PETA 
Okay, the difference of your phosphotang stick, hematoxylin from the other kinds of hematoxylin is the fact that pita, okay, is allowed to undergo natural ripening. Okay, so your phosphotang stick acid, hematoxylin, um, it, uh, it is allowed to undergo natural ripening ripening okay as compared to the other ones add other ones as, com as compared to the others okay which are artificially ripened okay so what is the mordant that is incorporated in your pita okay the more than uh, more than tama the mordant that is incorporated in your pita is phospho 1%, na, uh, it's in your module, 1% aqueous phosphotangstic acid. Okay, so that is the mordant. What is the, uh, what, what oxidizing agent is incorporated? Nada. Okay, nan. None. Nan. Because it is allowed to undergo natural ripening. Okay. Another is your copper hematoxylin. So this is, yes, another kind of hematoxylin that we use in the laboratory and it is oftentimes asked in the board exam. Okay, so basically your copper hematoxylin, this is utilized for the demonstration of your spermatogenesis. Okay, spermatogenesis. All right, so class kindly disregard this you know, picture. This is supposed to be in the next slide. Okay, so those are the things that you have to know about hematoxylin. All right, so let us now move on to another natural dye uh, that we use in the laboratory. That's your cochineal dye. Okay, so your cochineal dye class, this is regarded as an old histologic dye. So that means if you go back to the history, of this particular dye, it has been used for histological press. Pre, sorry, okay. It has been used for histological preparations uh, for a very long time already. Okay, that's why it is considered to be an old histologic dye. Okay. Yes. So your cochineal dye, it is extracted from a bug. Okay, hindi bag, hindi bag ha. Huh? Bug. Okay. It is extracted from a female cochineal bug. Okay. And the scientific name is your cocus cacti. Okay. Why cocus cacti? Why cocus? Because if you're gonna look at their shape, they have a cocci shape. Okay. We're round, round sila. Diba? Just like in uh, bacteriology, we have the cocci shape because they are they are round, round, round. Okay, yes, round, round, round. That's the term cocos. Cacti because they live in cacti. Okay, or in cactus. Diba? Cactus, that's the, ano, that's the singular form. And then the plural form we don't have the word cactuses we make use of the term cacti as the plural okay so this is this is where they live they live in your cacti okay cocus cacti that is your female cochineal bug all right so your uh your uh okay the dye or the Yes, the dye or the solution that is extracted from this female bugs, okay, from this female bugs, they are um they are treated. Okay, they are treated with alum. So after treatment with alum, you are able to produce the dye carmine. Okay, you are able to produce the dye. Carmine. Your carmine class, carmine, okay, your carmine class, um, it has a wide application, particularly for fresh materials in the laboratory, okay, and particularly also for smear preparations. So they are primarily utilized for 
fresh materials and smear preparations. Okay? Yan. So, your carmine, it provides a powerful uh, chromatin and nuclear staining, just like for your hematoxylin. Okay, ayan. So, carmine, this is a powerful chromatin and nuclear stain. Okay? So, we can actually, okay, we can actually produce two types of uh, carmine, okay, depending upon the reagent that we add to your carmine solution. So, the first one, carmine as your picric acid, okay? we are able to produce your picrocarmine. Yes. Your picrocarmine, this is an important dye or stain for your neuropathological studies. For your neuropathological studies. Okay? So we have picrocarmine. Carmine plus picric acid. Another is when you treat or when you add, okay, uh, when you add a and you add aluminum chloride to your carmine. So, carmine plus aluminum chloride, you are able to produce best carmine. Okay? Your best carmine class. So, this is utilized for the demonstration of glycogen. Alright? So, this is utilized for the demonstration of your glycogen. Okay? So, that's your, those are your Cox khaki. Yes, and this is. Yeah, this is the natural dye that we extract from them. Okay, all right. So those are the things that you have to remember for your coquignol dye. Okay, next, the last natural dye that we have is your or orsin. Okay, your orsin. All right, so your orsin class, again, this is a natural dye that is ex extracted. Okay, that is extracted from lichens. Oh, lichens. Okay, so this is a natural dye. It is a vegetable dye that is uh, that is extracted from your lichens. Okay, it is extracted from your lichens. So initially, the one that we extract, that we directly extract from your lichens, okay, from your lichens, is colorless. Yes, it is a colorless uh, solution which we directly extract from your lichens, okay? In order for it to have color, in order for it to have color, you have to treat it, okay? You have to treat it with ammonia, all right? So, um, the solution from your lichens is treated with ammonia and exposed to air in order for us to produce a blue-violet or seen dye or stain, okay? So, in order for us to produce a blue or violet uh, dye, okay, dye or stain, all right? So, take note that um, your orsin, okay, or the dye that we extract from your lichens, okay, it is considered to be a weak acid and it is uh, soluble in your alkali solutions, okay? So, I repeat, it is a weak acid and it is soluble in your alkali solutions. So your orsin, okay, your orsin, um, it is uh, it is uh, a stain or a dye that we use to demonstrate your elastic fibers. And your elastic fibers or your orsin rather imparts a dark brown color to your elastic fibers. Okay, so those are the different natural dyes that we have in the laboratory. All right, so now we move on to your synthetic dyes. Okay, class, ayan. So your synthetic dyes, um, these are, these are of course produced in the laboratory. Okay, these are produced, um, these are artificially produced or Sorry, this are <laughs> this are uh this are synthetically produced or yes produced in the laboratory. Okay, so they are 
uh, they are uh, hydrocarbons in nature and they are considered to be benzene derivatives. Okay, so when you say benzene derivatives, so uh, they contain the aromatic ring benzene, your C6H6. Okay, ayan. So just like, for example, for this particular uh, stain, which is actually your crystal violet, okay, so you have there uh, your benzene rings, okay, and you have probably encountered it also in your uh, hemat hematology one, right? When you discussed uh, differential count, okay, or the preparation of your uh, the preparation of your um, blood films, stained blood films, okay. So remember that in your in the staining of your blood films, we make use of your uh, methylene blue and the derivatives of your methylene blue, which we, re we refer to as your azures. Okay, so if you're going to look at the structure of your methylene blue as well as the different derivatives or azures, okay, so you would be able to see there a lot of benzene rings, which is a characteristic of your synthetic dyes. Okay, so since, ayan, since um, they were originally, your synthetic dyes were originally uh, extracted from coal tar. Uh, from coal, yeah, from coal tar. So they are referred to as your coal tar dyes. Okay, and since they contain your benzene ring as part of their structure, so they are otherwise referred to as your aniline dyes. Uh, you look at, uh, you go back to your organic chemistry, okay? Your aniline dye, it contains your benzene ring. Right, yes. Uh, so that's why synthetic dyes are otherwise referred to as coal tar dyes or aniline dyes. Okay, so for your uh, synthetic dyes, there are two, yes, there are two important components that have to be present. One is your chromophore and then the other one is your octochrome. Okay, so before we can say that a synthetic dye or that a synthetic substance, okay, is considered to be a dye or a stain, it should be able to do two things, okay, two things that are, uh, that would, uh, that would qualify a substance to be a synthetic dye. Number one, it should be able to impart color, okay, of course. This is a dye. This is a, we're talking about dyes. We're talking about stains. Okay. What good, nakalimutan ko yung ano. Okay. What good can we get from, oh, what good can we get? Okay. What can we get or how can we, how can we provide of optical differentiation if your dye, okay, if your dye or your stain does not impart color? That's basically the goal of staining, to impart color for optical differentiation. And so, your synthetic dye, in order for your substance rather, in order for it to be qualified as a synthetic dye, it should be able to impart color. Okay? Another, it should be able, of course, to retain color. Okay? Yes. Yes. It should be able to retain color. Otherwise, okay, otherwise, how are you going to ensure optical differentiation even for, uh, even, even after storage, okay? Or yes, if it does not retain color, then the tendency is the dye will, will just be washed out during the staining technique, okay? So these are the two basic requirements for your synthetic dyes. It should be able to impart color. It should be able to retain color, okay? Ayan. So your chromophore, yes, your chromophore, this is the uh, structure, the specific, uh, the specific component of your synthetic dye that produces color. Okay? It is an atomic grouping that is present in the structure of your synthetic dye or of your, uh, yes, of your synthetic dye that produces color okay it should be able to produce color um, on the substance that it is supposed to stain 
Okay, yes, that it is or on the uh, on the uh, tissue component that it is supposed to stain. Okay, yes. The substance, therefore, okay, please do not be uh, confused. Ha? The structure in your synthetic dye that we refer to it as your chromophore. Okay, a particular substance that contains a chromophore is referred to as your chromogen. All right, ayan. So when we say chromogen class, is it automatic that uh, we consider it as a dye or as a stain? No. Yes. Because when we say chromogen, it only indicates its ability to impart color. Okay? It, it, uh, it is a substance capable of imparting color. Okay, nakuha ba? Okay, the structure in your substance that imparts color is your chromophore. The substance, therefore, that is capable of imparting color is referred to as your chromogen. Now, can we call your chromogen as a synthetic dye already or as a synthetic stain? No. Okay, because your chromogen, sorry. Your chromogen is only able to satisfy one basic requirement, and that is to impart color. Okay, what is the other uh, equally important, uh, um, uh, equally impor important requirement? It has to retain color. Okay, nakuha. So the color imparted, therefore, of uh, your chromogen, the substance, okay, or your chromophore, that's the structure. Okay, it is not permanent. Yan. It is not permanent. That's why a chromogen is not automatically a synthetic dye. Okay, so what is missing in your chromogen? The one that is missing is your oxochrome. All right, ayan. So oxochrome, so this is the one that promotes color retention in your uh, in the various tissue components or tissue constituents. So, specifically, your oxochrome. <clears throat> Dito na lang class, ha? Okay. So, op, your oxochrome, this is an auxiliary. The, anong spelling? Sorry. <laughs> anong spelling na auxiliary? Okay. This, sorry. Anong spelling ka ba? Okay. This is an auxiliary radical. Okay. It is an auxiliary radical or substance. Okay. Or component. Okay. Uh, that makes uh, the substance. Okay. Taglet. Kamalito kayo. Okay. So, ilagay ko na lang auxiliary. So, this is the auxiliary radical or components okay or components that makes the substance capable of electrolytic dissociation <gasps> analytical chemistry dish okay ayan tama so i repeat your oxochrome this is the one that promotes color retention this is the auxiliary auxiliary radical or component okay or component which will allow electrolytic dissociation okay which will allow uh, electrolytic dissociation i don't know if you have discussed this in your hema one ha but um electrolytic dissociation this is important in the ionization okay the ionization process that has to take place in your stain or in the substance itself or in your dye and okay and of course um the tissue component or constituent that you are trying to stain okay electrolytic dissociation allows ionization to take place okay it allows ionization to take place why is there a need for us to ionize because binding will only take place if the components which are involved in the staining process are ionized. Okay? Yes, binding of the dye to your structures will only, okay, will only happen if both of them are ionized. 
Okay? So, there will be an electrostatic attraction between opposing charges. Okay? Between opposing charges. Alright, yes. So, once your dye, uh, once your substance, okay, contains both your chromophore and your oxychrome, um, it is now referred to as your dye or stain. That's the only time that we call it a dye or a stain. Okay? So, in order for you class to uh, better understand the role of uh, ionization, okay, the role of your ionization in order to create electrostatic uh, attraction between the dye, okay, between the dye and the tissue components, okay. So let me just try to explain it further. Okay, explain po natin para naintindihan. Alright, ayan. So remember that after ionization, what becomes of your dye, of course, it will become ionized. Okay, such that an unionic dye, oh, for sure you were able to discuss this in your HEMA 1. Okay, for example, your unionic dye, your unionic, this is um, considered to be your acidic dye. Okay, so your unionic dye, so sabi natin, electrostatic attraction between opposing charges will happen. Okay, so in short, an anionic dye, okay, so will bind to, it will bind to a cationic, it will bind to a uh, cat, cationic structure. Tama? Yes. So an anionic dye or an acidic dye, okay, will bind to your cationic structure. So therefore, your cationic structure is the one that is basic. Okay, so in contrast, if we consider or if we use your cationic dye, so your cationic dye, this is considered to be a basic dye. So it will, again, um, be attracted, okay, it will, uh, it will, there will be an electrostatic attraction between your cationic dye and your anionic structure. Okay, between your anionic structure. Therefore, your anionic structure is considered to be acidic. Okay, yes. So class, take note that um, uh, there are two uh, when it comes to your synthetic dyes, okay, or when it comes to uh, staining technique in general. Uh, there are two things that we have to consider, okay? The, the charge, the net charge, okay, as well as the pH. And I have incorporated already, okay, uh, these two factors that we consider in the staining reaction. All right, ayan. So um, there is a creation of your electrostatic attraction. That's why your oxochrome is very important. Because without your oxochrome, there will be no attraction, okay, uh, that will uh, exist between your dye and the structure. All right, ayan. All right. <clears throat> okay. All right. So in this case, yes, in this case, tapos na, <laughs> All right. In this case, okay. So in order, so say for example, ha, huh? say for example, this is your tissue. Okay. And then uh, this is your dye. Oh, parang ganyan lang siya. Okay. So there will be an attraction. Yan. So if there is, therefore, if there is an attraction, if there is, okay, so in between your structure and your dye, there is the, the presence of your uh, electrostatic attraction. Okay. If there is class, tama ba yung spelling ko? Okay, if there is class, uh, an electrostatic attraction between your dye and your tissue, Will the color be retained? Will the color be retained? Yes. Because of that attraction. Okay? Because of that attraction class. Alright? So that's why the role of your oxochrome is essential in your synthetic dyes. Okay? So your synthetic dye uh, cannot be called a synthetic dye or a dye without your oxochrome. 
because there will be no uh, color retention. All right, yes. So I think I have explained it well. Ah, feeling. Feeling, ka, madam. Okay, I have ex exhausted <laughs> all of my, yes, all of my, all of the things that I know. Yes. Okay, ayan. So uh, before I end this video, may I just also discuss. Okay, may I also just discuss. Okay, the different solvents, yes, the different solvents that we use uh, for the preparation of your staining solutions. Okay, so first, of course, is your water. Okay, so if uh, we make use of water, it has to be always, always distilled. Yes, unless otherwise, okay, unless otherwise stated by the manufacturer. So meaning, ma'am, can I use tap water? Yes. If the manufacturer says so, you may use tap water. Okay? But it should always be distilled. Okay? So if the manufacturer did not specify uh, did not specify the, that you can use tap water, okay, or any kind of water for that matter, okay, the safest, the safest kind of water that you have to use is your distilled water. Okay, but if it says there, uh, if it says there in your uh, insert, product insert, that you can you, you may use tap water, then you can use tap water. Okay, another is your alcohol. Yeah, so this is another solvent. So if, for example, you make use of ethanol, so ethanol, so this is usually used in various concentrations. Okay, so various concentrations of ethanol can be utilized. Another kind of, uh, of alcohol that you can use is your methanol. So for your methanol, uh, we usually, okay, we usually utilize absolute. Okay, we usually utilize absolute methanol. Why? Because uh, your absolute methanol um, ensures that no acetone is present in your uh, solution. Okay, so one uh, particular requirement if you are going to make use of your methanol is that it should be acetone-free. Okay, yan. So other uh, solvents that you can use, you can also make use of aniline water. Okay, so you can also make use of aniline water. So for aniline water, yes, for aniline water, so we prepare it. Okay, 10 ml of aniline Okay, 10, 10 ml of aniline over, okay, plus na lang, plus uh, 0 0.5 to 1 liter of this, of hot, sorry, of hot distilled water. Okay, so aniline water is prepared using 10 ml of aniline plus 0 0.5 to Okay, plus 0 0.5 to 1 liter of hot distilled water. Okay, and the last solvent that you can use is phenol. So we make use of 0 0.5 to 5, sorry, to 5% concentration of phenol. Okay, ayan. So those are the solvents that we can use in the laboratory for the preparation of your staining solutions. Okay, so I will end my discussion now. Now and uh, yes, yes, babush. Bye. Kam samida, kam samida. Um, anyo sa yo, tama ba? Babush. Okay, babush. Bye. If you have questions, don't forget to raise it in our chat box.